it's amazing sometimes to me how uh, how things work and all this kind of stuff. And and I, you know, I prepare these lessons usually on oh, Monday or Tuesday. Try to you know get them down on paper. As you see, uh, that's about four verses worth. So anyway, but it's amazing how I do those things. And then as the week goes along, go back over them eight to ten times. I usually on Sunday morning, the last time I go before I get up here to share with you. And it's amazing to me how God changes it every time I do. I get up here and I go, I have no idea what you're going to get today. Because whatever gets out of here is what you get. I don't know what that is. you know. But it's also amazing to me how God you know, reveals himself. Even verses that we've read, and these verses, you know, that uh, I've read here in chapter 3, I'm sure you've read the same same thing I have for the last five or six weeks. We've been in chapter 3, trying to get out of chapter 3. And how each day and each time you read a verse, how, how he talks to you, how he reveals himself to you more and more. Just like this morning uh, in verse 9, I'm going to read, it says, where your fathers tested and tried me for 40 years, saw what I did. You know, this is, this is, he's talking about the Hebrew people. He's talking about how they brought them out of bondage and how he brought them out of slavery and give them a promised land and all these things. And then we, we get to our prayer time this morning. And isn't it amazing how God has blessed our country, how God has blessed us, and how we are just throwing it away. I don't care whether you're a Democrat or Republican, who you are, you know, you're God's chosen people. You know, you're God's people. You're, you're God's, you know, people that he has saved through his salvation and saved by the blood that he's, pray, he's paid for us. And we 10% vote. And that's the only way we have a control over things that happen to us is by going to the ballot box. And I don't care who you vote for. It makes no difference. Because whoever you vote for is probably as bad as the other one that you didn't vote for. <laughs> have no idea. But at least you have a choice. At least you have something to say. You know, and just like these people, all they wanted to do was bellyache and yell and, and fuss and everything else. Didn't want to do anything. We're the same way. You know, we get a chance to make a difference, whatever that difference is, and we just throw it away and then we bellyache for four years. And so we can do to us what we should. Yeah. And so, you know, so we should not expect to be blessed any more than these people were, were expected to be blessed. Amen. If we rebel against Christ, if we rebel against what we know to be as Christians, and we rebel and do not do God's will in our life, then we should expect to have the same type of judgment put on us that's put on these Israelite people. My goodness gracious, it scares you to death. You know, that to know that, you know, for them, for 40 years, for them, they are basically looking at death penalty. And we looking at death penalty, you know, possibly in our country. Okay? Because of just not being submissive to God's will in our lives. Be on our knees and pray that we'll have a change. Scripture tells us that, you know, we're to pray for our leaders. Whether you agree with them or not, whether you like them or not, it makes no difference. We're to pray for our leaders because God can make a difference in their life. And if God makes a difference in their life, it'll make a difference in our life. Because if we follow Christian people, Christian people will cause blessings of God to be bestowed on us. But if we do not follow Christian people, then God's blessing will be withheld from us. I'm telling you. It just uh, you know, just just amazing how things go and how things do, and you know that type of deal and what God God does for us. Uh, you you want to say something real quick? Um, I thought about verse six of one that says, "You didn't express your voice with the vote; don't express your vote voice with the people." Yeah, yeah. Good luck for that. <laughs> anyway, okay. Hebrews chapter three, verse nine. We, we, we just read that about the about the uh, I guess the judgment that was put on these people. Judgment put on these people because of their rebellion, because of what they did. Because, you know, God had brought them out of Egypt. He had blessed them in so many ways, brought them out of slavery. He had fed them when they needed to be fed. He, had, he gave them water when they, need, when they were thirsty. He had provided leadership for them. He had taken them to the promised land that he had promised for them to do. All of these things, and all they wanted to do was rebel against him. And eventually, God had, had enough and said, okay, you want to rebel, rebel in the desert till you die. Just like us. Rebel at, at some point in time, God is going to stop blessing us because we're not in his will, okay? So verse 9, verse 10, where we're supposed to start today that I sent out to you. That is why I was angry with that generation, and I said, their hearts are always going astray. They have not known my ways. It's amazing to me, you know, as we read scripture and all these kind of things, in the very first part of this says, 
That is why God, I, that is why God was angry. You know, we have to do a lot to make God angry. We have to, we have to sin an awful lot. Uh, you know, if he just looked down at the sins we do each and every day, he'd be angry to continually. There'd be no time for blessing. There'd be more time of, of anger. And anger here is talking about frustration, of uh, being vexed at these people. And I use the old word, you know, that, uh, that I've used when I was growing up. And all. There's not anger. My dad was never angry. He was mad. <laughs> There's a difference between angry and mad. Angry is just when you're upset. Mad is when you do something about it. Okay? <laughs> and I think here, that's where God is. God here is fixing to do something about it with them. Because of their unbelief, because of their rebellion against him. You know, and many of this thing throughout, cha throughout chapter 3 here, we, he has given us this analogy, or given us this picture back in Numbers of the people coming out of slavery to the promised land. He equates that to here in Hebrews and the people that, the Hebrew writers talking to the people that are living in this day and time. And then project that on further, he is talking to us today. You know, I, you know, we get to down to, I think, verse 19, but I, you know, I'll share it with you because I'm probably going to get to verse 19 today. You know, basically of all the things that he does for us, you know, all the things that, that God gives us each and every day. You know, and, it, you know and, the, and the way he wants to bless us, but we keep throwing that away. But, you know, God says we're to be bless him and we're to try to stay in his will even though we're living in sin. You know, if we have to wait till we're out of sin in order to bless God, in order to try to be in the will of God and do the things that God wants us to do in our life, then we'll never get there. And God makes it perfectly plain, saying you are, you are rebellious, sinful people. We have sin nature in our hearts, so therefore we'll never be without sin in our life until we die or until the rapture, whichever comes first, praying for the rapture first, you know, type deal. But until that point in time, we will still be in sin. That does not mean that we can't be seeking the face of God each and every day wherever we are. You know, as you know, Satan likes to throw those sins that we, we commit in our lives each and every day. He likes to throw that up and say, you're not worthy to be a Christian. You're not worthy of the price that Christ paid for you. You're not worthy for his death and his crucifixion. You know, you just stop right there and just say, Satan, get behind me. I am worthy. I am worthy because Christ has made me worthy. Because I am now a child of God because of what he did. Okay? And we live for that. And we revel in that each and every day. We should look forward to the next day's opportunities to do for God what God has in our life. To witness to people. To be a living person for God so that they can see the blessings that he's blessed on me and the blessing he'll bless on them. Even though things are rotten in this world. God still blesses you each and every day. You can't get up in the morning and see a sunrise or set in the afternoon. I think it's Thursday afternoon. We was looking, Carol and I looked at the sunset, and it was just the most beautiful sunset that I've, I've seen since the day before. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. How God blesses us and wants to, wants to bless us. You hear said, you know, he is, he is mad. They have provoked him to being angry. They provoked him in their continual sinning, their continual rebellion, their continual unbelief. Okay? And we do the same thing. And the Hebrew writers talking to the people there, hey, this is the same thing that's happening here. And you know, as we go through these things, we have to remember what we're, what we're reading in Hebrew. He has given us a story from the, the wilderness wanderings of Moses and all these people. But he is talking to the people in Hebrews living at that point in time. And he has said, because of your, your sinfulness, because of your rebellion, you're going to wander in the desert 40 years and judgment be, be brought on you and you will die. <coughs> he's talking to Hebrew people here and Hebrew people is exactly the same thing that he's talking about back in Numbers. <coughs> Why? Because, because, you know, this is being written somewhere just close to 30, 40 years after the Messiah was crucified. Hebrew was written about 66 A.D. Hebrew people is talking about them. If you don't stop rebelling against God, judgment will be brought on you. And we know what happened in 70 A.D. 70 A.D., the temple was destroyed. Many, 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 many Jewish people died because of their unbelief, because of their obeying against God. You bring that on up now to 2022. Our obeying against God, how many are we going to have to pay the price for this? How many times did God have to show us 
from Numbers to Hebrews to present day, that God is in control and God wants you to hear everything. If you rebel against him, he eventually will bring judgment on you. Now that judgment and the judgment throughout scripture, I'm so far off these notes, I don't know where I'm going. <laughs> um, judgment against scripture is always judgment on physical life. Okay? Many times for us, you and I as Christians, it is always on physical life. You will die a physical death, but not a spiritual death. But for those people that do not know Christ, those people that are not saved, that are lost brothers and sisters around us, that judgment he brings on them is not only physical life, it is also spiritual death. Because there, once they draw their last breath, their fate is sealed. They would go to the white throne judgment to be thrown in the lake of fire to be in torment forever. All of those that don't know Christ. You and I, our physical death, we'll die a physical death, but our spiritual death is in God's hand, and our spiritual death is secure. We don't have that anymore. Christ paid that price for us. He has given us eternal life. Eternal life means we never die spiritually ever again because he has paid that price for us. Okay? So we need to know that and understand that and, and live like that each and every day. Okay? Uh, they, they provoked him to the point where they had to, they had to wander in the wilderness 40 years. They provoked him to the point where that entire generation died. Not one of them, except for Caleb and Joshua, not one of them made it in the promised land. Isn't it amazing? Not one of them made it in there, except for Caleb and Joshua. Even Moses, the man cho chose by God to lead them into the promised land, died outside the promised land. He died outside, outside of there because of sin in his life. So we're not any of us both. I don't care where it's the president or the mayor or the whatever it may be, or you and I, none of us live beyond God's control and God, God's judgment. Okay? So he's telling them here, he said in verse 10, he talks about said that he was angry with them. And why was he angry with them? Because their hearts were going astray. Their hearts back in, in the wilderness time was going astray. In the Hebrew people here, where the Hebrew writers talk to, their hearts is going astray. What does that mean? They're, they're living in apostasy now. They're giving up their first love of God. When you and I were first saved, boy, as soon as you were saved, as soon as God came to your life, you were on a mountaintop. I mean, you, you looked out there and said, oh, the blessing of God it just surrounds me. And then as each and every day as the world beats you down, as Satan comes into your life and, and, and tempts you in so many ways, we get further and further and further away from that experience. But God doesn't want us to get away from that experience. God just wants us to to witness Him and live for Him each and every day, like that same day that you were saved. Because every day you get up is a new salvation day for you and I. We should look forward to what we can do. What we can do. I was talking to Doug one day, and we was yapping about the, our dates and our weeks and months and things we've been doing and everything else. And he says he, he goes to, does the, his test on, which I don't, don't tell, ask him about this test. I have no idea what he does. Um, he goes and does these tests to these people and he goes in and he thinks and he prays God before he ever walks up the door. Give me an opportunity to witness to them about my Savior. We should all do that every day. When we go to Brookshire's and we go to Walmart, we should say, give me a chance to witness for my Savior today. But most of us go in there and go, boy, I hope he's cloud gets out of my way so I can get my stuff and get out of here. <laughs> That's all we do. You like me and you go into Walmart, you can't find what you went in there for anyway, so don't worry about it. Just get something to leave, okay? And then leave your list and you'll get it eventually because you'll run over it one of these days, okay? But again, here is, you know, he was angry with them because they had given up their first love. They had given up knowing him and living for him. They had rebelled against those things that he had told them was so important for them to do, to give him their first love. Because remember what these people in Hebrews were thinking about doing they wanted to give up their Christianity. They wanted to go back and live under the law. Why? Because they were being crucified or you know, criticized and all these other things and, and experienced <coughs> such, such hatred of the people around them. They wanted to get out of these things that they were undergoing and say, it's better if I went back to the law and lived under the law with the rest of these people than it is to stay under Christianity. So let me go back to there, get out of Christianity. When it gets better, I'll come back to, come back to Christianity and back to salvation. That's not God's plan. That's impossible to do. Okay? 
A couple of reasons it's impossible to do. Christ has to die again in order for you to be saved again if you ever gave it for salvation. Second thing is, once you've got your salvation, you can't give it up. Boy, I wish that God had just made, provided for us and said, hey, everybody's going to be saved when he first made this world, and we wouldn't be in this mess that we're in. Okay? We'd be done with that. But isn't it, isn't it amazing, isn't it great, isn't it spectacular that God has told us throughout Scripture that once you have salvation, you can't give it up. That's, that's something we ought to live on each and every day, knowing that God has your salvation in His hand. Your eternal life is in His hand, not your hand. Okay? Their eternal life was secure. Numbers 14, verse 20, talks about it. said they, they sinned against God and God forgave them. Throughout the scriptures, he talks about those people that sinned against him and God forgave them and they were still brethren in the Lord. Regardless of where they live, they're still brethren in the Lord. What a blessing that is, you know, to know each and every day. He <clears throat> said, their, their hearts are always going astray. They do not know my ways. The only way you and I will ever know God's ways is to get it right here. Get it right here. Personally. Personally, you can't go six days and then come to church on a Sunday and expect to know God's way by listening to the preacher. You can't go six days and come on Sunday and know God's ways by listening to a teacher in your Sunday school. God wants to teach you His ways, and the only way you know His ways is to be in His Word to let Him show you His ways. Okay? So you have to experience that personally. I can't instill in you the love of God. You have to instill that in yourself through the God's mercy and His grace and His, His salvation and His power. Okay? And that's what He'll do for you. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 11 <clears throat> says, I declare an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Verse 11 here is talking about, it says, in His anger, He has brought judgment on them. And when He has brought judgment on them, they're, remember, they're sitting down... You remember the map we looked at for the last two or three weeks? They're sitting down at Cadiz Barnea. They're sitting just outside the promised land. They're sitting just outside of the Canaan rest, if you will. Their, their, their rest from being in sin, their rest of, of cessation, of struggle, if you will. The promised land in Scripture is always, always not talking about heaven. Many times here we talk about heaven and so many things and how beautiful it's going to be in the streets of gold and everything else. But when we read down through Scripture, the promised land that we see in Scripture is talking about the promised land that the Israelites are going to, going to inherit. This land of milk and honey, in there, which, the, which the Jews were going into at this point in time out of Kadesh Barnea. Okay? So God had said, because of those things, you will never enter into my rest. You will never enter into the promised land. You would never enter into a cessation, if you will, or stopping of sin, over, over control and control in your life. Okay? So God has blessed us, and he's talking about, said, he wants that for every one of us. He wanted that for all of them. He wanted that for all the people here in Hebrews. He wants that for me and you, this cessation of struggle with sin, if we're to submit to him and, and live in his ways and his will in our life. Cain and Rest is talking about throughout Scripture, okay? Talks about it here, Deuteronomy 1, 34 through 36, Deuteronomy 12, verse 9 and 10, Joshua 23, 1, on and on and on, where he is talking about what God wants for us and the blessings he has for us, okay? But how we throw that away, how we fall so short of what God has for us and what he wants to do. We fall short because we do not believe, we do not believe that God can live in this sinful heart that I have. We know who Christ is. The devil knows who Christ is. Satan himself is very familiar with who Christ is and who God is. And he is very familiar of the price that Christ paid for you and I. Very familiar. He is probably more familiar with all those things than you and I are, and we have experienced that. But God wants us to know that, hey, he has that rest for us. But our, our lives, our sins, our rebellion would cost us though that rest, even as we live today, just like it cost the rest of these people here. And in Numbers, when he, when he made all of them die in the 40 years. And in, in Hebrews, where he's talking about here, these people he's talking about here, you know, as they are going to have to go through the 70, 80 judgment, and many of them are going to die. Now, 
who are we talking about? Who's, who's this talking about? We're looking at verse 14 and 15 and we get down to it. Who he's talking about, he's talking about believers. He's talking about those that have salvation that's going to have to pay that price. And that price is physical death, okay, because of what he's done. We lose his blessings. You know, if we just revel in God's blessing, we'd be on top of the world all the time. We'd be on top of the world all the time. Even wherever it is. I tell Carol sometimes we sit out on the back porch most mornings. Used to have been about 6 o'clock. Now it seems like we're about 8 o'clock, you know, type deal. But uh, it's time change when we're back 7 o'clock, so we're okay. <laughs> but again, you know, that you sit out and you have a cup of coffee and you look out and just out in our backyard and, you know, this type of deal. And it's just peaceful. You hear the birds sing, and you see the trees around, and you see the grass. And, you know, sometimes I tell God, I'm saying, watch the grass grow. <laughs> what a wonderful thing that is. The blessing that he gives us each and every day. God wants that for us. Okay? <clears throat> we know, that, you know that, the, that the people in numbers paid the price. They paid the price of physical death because of their unbelief and their rebellion. But God is not that for us. God wants us to go into heaven itself, not the promised land of Israel, but he wants us to go into heaven and experience, experience life with him. Okay? Verse 12 through 15 talks about the application of this idea, both the positive and negative application. It says in verse 12, it says, see to it, brothers. Here he's talking about, he has said he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. Okay? See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. His point is so straightforward. His point, you know, drive to the moral home, you know, type deal of knowing that we are bringing our step out of God's will. We are losing those blessings he has for us because we choose that. I don't know why any of us would ever choose to be tormented, be sick, hurt, whatever it may be, over being blessed by God. But it seems like every day we choose that side. We choose the human side. We choose to follow the lost part of our hearts but rather than the saved part of our hearts where the soul of the Spirit lives. Okay? <clears throat> because of our unbelief returns turns away from God. Verse 13 says, But encourage one another daily as long as it is to be called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Here he goes back to and he, see, he mentions today two or three times. He says, be, be encouraged today. Today in Scripture talks about the now, the here and now. Not 25 years from now. Not what you experienced three weeks ago or three years ago or 30 years ago or you know, that type of deal. But be encouraged and do God's bidding today in your life. That's the only time that you can do God's bidding in your life. It's today, the here and now. The things that's done past, you can't do anything about that. That's over and done, past and gone. The things that's going to come in the future, you can do something about it, but it's not until it gets here. Okay? But today, as I'm living and breathing and today, in this moment in time, I can live for God as God wants us to do. Okay? So, he's, so he's talking about here, today, today we live, be encouraged one another daily. He is saying in this verse, in verse 13, I believe it is, he has said, come alongside of all your brethren. They are spirits in unbelief. They are spirits in rebellion. They are spirits in hurt, just like we are today. And he says, we as Christians should come alongside every one of our brothers and sisters in Christ and lift them up. Lift them up. Shoulder with them their hurts. Also, be there in a time of stress and need in their lives, but also rejoice with them when time's from time to rejoice. He gives us back in John 14 where he says, you know, Scripture, God sent the Holy Spirit to lift us up, to encourage in us, to come alongside of us. So we have the Holy Spirit doing that personally for us, coming alongside and holding us up in God's will. And what we're to do is to go alongside all those brothers and sisters in Christ and lift them up in their daily walk. Help them to live in the, in the in moment in time of God himself. Not in troubles, trials, and tribulations, but help them to see God's will in their life. Even though we don't understand it. And we won't understand it for so many years. You won't understand it until you sit at the feet of Christ himself. And at that point in time, you won't care. You will be too busy rejoicing around the throne and enjoying the blessings of God personally, in person, to worry about what happened 25 years ago. 
You hear so many people say, when I get there, I'm going to ask God, why, why he did this to me? When you get there, that why he did that to you is going to be long gone. No longer here. No longer matters. Because you are by that and gone and done. Okay. What a beautiful blessing it is. And he's saying here that deceitful sin that have in life, that sin of apostasy, that sin of going away from the first love of Christ. He said, go along beside them and lift them up and help them to see God's bidding in their life and God, God blessing them. How he wants to bless them. Okay. We'll begin verse 14 next week. Our time is gone. Okay, it's back home. Oh, that's okay. We don't worry about that. We'll be done, you know, hopes by the rapture, whenever that may be. Okay. We just we really bless him. Bless God and praise God for his word and things he does. Yes, did you? I had a funny Bible seek your face each and every day. And the only way we seek your face each and every day, God, is to be in your word. And Father, you're, you're so, so faithful to meet us there. You're waiting each and every day and each and every minute to meet us for a blessing. Father, help us to slow our lives down. Help us to get our eyes off the world and get our eyes on Christ. And understand the important things that we're living for and with today is what you have for us and what you want us to do. Father, pray for all those that's on our prayer list. Father, just be with them in a special way. Thank you for comfort. Thank you for care. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for, for healing. Oh, God, you're, you're so, so precious and so powerful. Help us, Father, to keep our eyes on you. Do not lose our first love. And our first love is Christ Jesus himself. Bless you and God's bless in Christ's name. Amen. Love you. See you next week.